So, uh, welcome to the weekly tenement dev session. Um, today we're gonna go into the KMS, all included components, what they do. A little bit of an overview for everyone to get a feel what's involved. Um, and then we're gonna discuss a bit what's uh, left to do and what our plan of attack is. Um, and I would kindly ask to take uh, to take the word, Ishmael. Okay. Um, okay, can you see my screen? Not yet. Uh, not yet. No. Um, so do you see the slides, KMS signing? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm going to give us like a brief overview on the KMS, uh, how it fits into the ecosystem. As uh, Alex said, what components are involved, uh, how it talks to Tendermint, how Cosmos is related. And then I'm going to um, explain slightly in more detail uh, the messages exchanged between the KMS and the other components and um, about the deserialization de serialization and what we changed there and why and um, so the current state of the work and what is left done to be done and um, hand over to a discussion um, and probably more details on the related projects. So the KMS, where does it fit into the whole stack? Um, it does here, uh, basically, in the signer, validator signer. So the green thing is Tenement Core, and Tenement Core talks to a validator, and the KMS uh, plays in this ballpark. Um, so what it does is basically it kind of implements this interface in Golang. So, uh, not in Golang, but this is the interface in Golang. There's an implementation of this in uh, Go and Tenement Core. Which is called remote signer, and um, so the KMS basically is such a remote signer with uh, more capabilities. I will briefly explain later. Um, so I always link in the slides uh, for those who want to see more the code and the context. Um, there are always links to those. Um, so. Where, where does the KMS, what does the KMS talk to? It basically talks to Tendermint because a Tendermint core um, in itself is, contains like a consensus algorithm, algorithm and uh, this algorithm is signature based. And um, so the KMS signs those messages necessary for the consensus, for instance. Um, and it is, it is connected to Tendermint via a secret connection by default. So it's an authenticated encryption scheme. Um, and um, it does so by using Signatory, which is a library implemented by Tony. It's a library that um, provides, so it's a dig digital signature library, but it's a multi-provider uh, library, which does provide um, for instance, uh, support to sign via Ledger, via YubiKey, and via different uh, libraries like uh, Ring uh, implementation in Rust. Well, all of these libraries actually are implemented in Rust or in uh, under, uh, wrapping uh, uh, C libraries in Rust. Uh, so it's like Ring, Dalek, uh, Sodium Oxide, uh, Oxide and um, those HSM things like the Ledger, Nano S, and UBHSM. Um, so the KMS serves several purposes. So it signs those messages, but it also tries to prevent uh, double signing. Um, and so it's not only the KMS, basically it also needs, um, the actual thing that signs needs to prevent the double signing as well. So it could be, um, for instance, the Ledger Nano S app on the very right here um, could, uh, keep track of the round and height um, of the things that it signs and only signs those that um, are incrementing. And I go from left to right. So the signatory already mentioned is this multi-provider uh, signature uh, library. 
Um, the UBHSM RS is a Rust uh, open source Rust implementation of something uh, that is usually proprietary. It's um, of the UBHSM. There exists a library called uh, libubhsm, and this is an open source implementation fully written in Rust, which basically provides the same functionality or more or less the same functionality. Tony could probably say in more detail what are the differences, if any. And um, so this enables to sign using the UBHSM. And there is another um, uh, interesting part, which is the Legend Nano S. And uh, it signs using the validator app. And in, able, in order to be able to do so, there is the repository Ledger Cosmos RS. Like, RS always only means that they're implemented in Rust. So this is basically. Um, this is basically the library that um, um, implements the protocol to be able to talk to the Ledger Nano. And uh, similarly, Ledger RS allows, to, uh, allows the connection to Ledger devices from Rust. Um, so this is how it fits into the whole ecosystem. So these are the related projects. Um, a short notice on why this is cool. Um, so the KMS gives validators the ability to have like high availability of signing keys, which you usually um, would have to like kind of implement yourself. So it provides you this service. Um, um, so basically, you you can just run such a KMS and uh, talk to it using these uh, RPC style messages, and it will sign the like sign the messages using the signing keys which are like highly available and um it also provides you like protecting these keys for instance via an hsm which the keys are on the hardware module or for instance the um service runs on a separate host separate from gaia d um so as i mentioned double signing protection is pretty cool um you have like you're able to uh sign several chains using one single service um, without like being uh, you having to implement this yourself. And uh, the signatory library provides you with like more and more signature providers. And uh, also something worth mentioning uh, is it's fully written in Rust, which is like provides you uh, more rigorous or more stricter memory safety guarantees. Um, so now I want to go over to the issue that was linked in the in the um, dev session as well, which was about uh, serialization and deserialization, the messages that are exchanged. Um, as I said, basically it's uh, the consensus messages, which are like proposal and votes. And proposal is just a, um, a proposed decision value for a round in the consensus. And the votes um, basically are votes on these proposed values. And there are uh, two steps because it's a PBFT style uh, consensus algorithm, like Tendermint is a PBFT style consensus algorithm. So there's a pre vote and a pre commit step. And um, Zarko wrote this spec, which, like, a fully detailed explains the, the messages exchanged. Um, Mm. So in more detail, what happens here between Tendermint and the KMS? Um, as I said, it's uh, an RPC style service. You send messages, and depending on these messages, several certain methods are invoked, and um, basically those messages get signed. And um, if, for instance, if you send the signed vote request, you um, it's basically just a wrapper around uh, like a vote, um, which contains all the fields necessary for a vote, and you um, receive back a signed vote response, which again is just a wrapper around the vote, but it also contains the signature for this vote and a potentially an error message if something went wrong. For instance, the HSM module was not available, or something else went wrong while signing, or yeah, and similar for proposal. 
So the details uh, of these structs can be uh, seen in, the, in, the, in this link again. Um, something else worth mentioning is those messages are amino encoded and they are registered types. So uh, a signed vote request basically is the length of the message, a prefix, um, it's like four bytes that identify the message. And then it's basically protobuf3. Um, and similar for the responses. Um, so yeah, and those messages get signed using signatory, um, but the actual messages that are signed are slightly different. So they are canonicalized. Um, previously, they were JSON encoded. I would quickly explain why they were JSON encoded and why we're changing this or why we changed this. Um, so there's another component which uses the Ledger Nano S um, and using another app, which is not the validator app, but the Tendermint user app. And there, transactions get signed. And for, um, uh, for that, we wanted to be able that users can actually see details of those transactions. And um, there, it made a lot of sense that the messages are human readable. And that's why we chose JSON. So these components similarly um, enable to talk to this app or to the Ledger Nano S. Um, um, so yeah, that was the reason why we chose JSON. Then um, there was a long discussion in Tendermint Core with loads of valuable input of the community where we were like, basically people said, told us that if you wanted to sign those uh, messages in an Ethereum contract that would consume uh, much more gas if it's a JSON string instead of a binary format. So after some back and forth, um, we like basically decided to switch to a binary format and use Amino. And at the same time, we had to make sure that in a restricted environment like uh, the Legend Nano S, where um, you basically just have a stack and you're very limited in the memory you can use and everything. You probably don't have a full protobuf or amino implementation. So um, we had to make sure that it's similarly easy to parse these sign bytes, the messages that are signed while, um, um, while not consuming um, more gas than necessary. On, on the smart contract. So what we did um, and what Juan basically proposed is to have uh, the fields sorted in a certain order such that you can basically jump um, fixed offsets between the fields. And then on the Ledger Nano S, you can read the fields that are uh, that you necessarily like you have to check for double signing protection, for instance, or if you have to validate and sign, um, you can yeah you can you can have uh, you have fixed offsets so that you can read and parse these messages without even implementing a full uh, amino protobuf library, which is useful anyways, not only in the Ledger Nano S, I guess. Um, so yeah, that was uh, why we switched to amino. It was uh, um, so, so basically, it also means the same thing for um, for processing these. Uh, these votes in Ethereum contracts, exactly. um, it, it'll be much cheaper because you don't have to do any complicated parsing. You just know exactly what the byte offset is, jump to it, read eight bytes, you know, call it an integer, and, and, uh, and you're done. Um, exactly. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's, it's useful in any context. You, the encoding is very, very simple. You have fixed sure. offsets. You can jump uh, between the fields. And um, yeah, that's probably useful everywhere. <laughs> where you want to read those. OK, um, so we, we switched to Amino Proto3 using the proposed, um, like what we had from the discussion in three steps. First, we collected um, all the information from the long discussion on this issue in an ADR, and drafted an ADR. Then we switched to Amino without touching the field order or making anything fixed size so that you can jump. And then we reorder the fields and uh, use the fixed size encoding. And this is all merged and done now. Um, so what so it's all is- It's but it'll be released this week. 
Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. It's not it's not in the release yet, but soon it will but be. It's on yeah. So and yeah, this was a, I think this was a really great instance of kind of our um, uh, matured development process, so to speak, starting with like a long drawn out issue that engaged a number of different elements of the community, talking about what their needs are and how we could how we could meet that. A lot of discussion there that eventually uh, became an architectural decision record that Ishmael wrote up. That's the ADR and then uh, implemented it in a series of steps, all of which have now been merged. So um, really, really great work, everyone that was involved in that. Thanks for all the input. Thank you, too. <laughs> and thanks, everyone, uh, on the input as well. So what is left to be done from my side, from the project I'm familiar with, is um, we need to update the KMS. There's a there's a open pull request that um, aims to add a full integration test and like talking to itself so the KMS talking to itself sends a message a proposal vote or something and signs it um, so this needs to be updated to uh, the new message format which is reordered according the, uh, to the ADR or the discussion we had um, there's also an ongoing discussion if we should delete heartbeat Bucky opened that during the weekend um, so or oh, probably we can also hide uh, the message. I didn't even mention it because we are going probably to delete it, but it's still something that needs to be done on the KMS side as well, whatever we change in Tendermint. And Could you uh, expand on the heartbeat context, like what, what it uh, implies, where we can delete it, um, what we're going to use instead of it's not needed at all? So my understanding, so I first thought, to be honest, I first thought like it's a heartbeat message as you would expect a heartbeat message um, to be. It's you, you, like it's sent on, like in in, in uh, p like certain period of time, every time to keep the connection alive, but that's not the case. So the case is that this heartbeat is just uh, a message for us to debug um, validators and um, so that you, Basically, a validator can send like a heartbeat message and tell everyone, "Hey, I'm alive." And um, yeah, and so there's an yeah. Sorry, this this the specific use case for this was when we introduced the idea of um, no empty blocks. So once we rolled out that feature, which allowed proposers to wait an indefinite amount of time before proposing, the idea mm -hmm. with the heartbeat message was while they're waiting, they would send this heartbeat message to everyone. Um, so that they know, you know, the consensus hasn't deadlocked. We're not in some fatal mode. The, you know, we're just waiting on the proposer to receive some transactions. Um, so it's really, it was really just for like, you know, logging, debugging, convenience purposes, just to notify us. Yes, the proposer is awake and and waiting for transactions. They haven't they haven't stopped running or anything like this. Um, but it's not acted on. The signature is actually not even checked. It doesn't contribute in any way to the um, to the rest of the code. It's not really dealt with programmatically. Um, so we can probably we can probably remove it altogether, um, and and just use other other metrics for um, the same purpose. Hmm. So we probably uh, still need some kind of actual heartbeat message that, for certain connection types, keeps the connection alive. That was my hmm. understanding, but it's very could be much simpler, just a, like an empty ping message. Uh, yeah, and there's so we do have the, that at the at the low level. Um, well, I mean, first TCP has that, and we're using TCP connections. Yeah. But there's also a uh, an explicit ping in the in the MCON in the P2P package, um, and okay. there's some discussion around potentially removing that since it might be redundant with the TCP keep alive stuff. But uh, that's a, a orthogonal issue. Okay. Important thing here also to mention is that the the consensus is not blocked on heartbeat. That every right. validator basically, when there, if it receives some transaction, it will basically proceed after some timeout. So the so we can't be blocked by some faulty proposer, you know, waiting on heartbeat. Right. That's why we, uh, because there there are some consensus protocol which are uh, let's say more depending on heartbeat, and then maybe you know it would make sense to consider it keeping it or doing something about it, like checking right. something, etc. But in our case, it seems that that if it's just for debugging, then, then it seems more reasonable to to clean this thing by removing. It. Yeah. Yeah. So, so raft, for instance, requires uh, a heartbeat that the leader is supposed to keep sending out. And once you, if you don't receive the heartbeat in a certain amount of time, then you'll you'll initiate a leader election process. Uh, but we don't have anything like that uh, in Tendermint. This heartbeat was really just for debugging purposes. Yeah. So yeah, we. 
probably will delete it. And um, as you said, like you said that there's a there's a in the peer to peer package there's a something similar that keeps the connection live. TCP has this, but as far as I remember, there was a pull request where um, for secret connection this was still introduced and seemed kind of necessary because the connection is not automatically keep, kept alive as it would be with TCP. Is that not right, Okay. I'm not sure. You'll have to yeah. link me to the to that PR. The Koyokan PR. Um, let me check. Okay, we can follow up on that. Uh, okay. yeah. separately from this. Do you okay, cool. think that maybe I'm I'm brainstorming here because I have not been working too much on this area? But is there any interest on measuring the latency between tendering and KMS? Because maybe if they're like kind of apart and there is a high latency that can provide some information. Sorry, can you repeat? That maybe if you have the KMS and, and the node, the tendermin node, like in different uh, hosts, and you have a high latency, maybe that latency is useful because I know that at least for for signing, high latency could result in issues. So the, the heartbeat or something similar could be used to measure that latency. Ah, the latency. Yeah, probably. It's um, actually I think that we we probably need some sort of. Uh, SLA between uh, KMS and, and validator now, uh, because if if it takes too long, uh, I was kind of always assuming that they are sitting next to each other, and that the latency is trivial. But if it if it can take more, then we probably need them to take this into account uh, uh, for for like timeout computation or I don't know, or maybe it will just uh, naturally just lead to bigger timeout, and so we are fine. But uh, uh, it it op opens a bit model, so we just need to to double check if it's fine. So hey, this is Tony. Um, so something else to consider is at least on the UBHSM, it has an echo command that can be used for like health checking and that kind of thing. So if you implement some sort of ping or heartbeat command, it could go all the way end to end to the UBHSM and back out. So you could like give it a UUID or something, right? It can send that to the HSM and back out, and you can kind of get like an end to end latency you're going on the way to the HSM. Yeah, it's a, that's a good idea. Um, we should, I think, so I think right now we just have a, a kind of simple timeout. Um, and then if the message doesn't come back within that timeout, then Tenement will disconnect. But we, we probably need to improve uh, the robustness of that because obviously. We, we should expect that that's going to happen in the lifetime of running a chain, and the thing should be able to reconnect uh, without losing too much ground. So that's uh, definitely something to attend to. Hmm. Cool. Maybe we can capture it as one of the follow-up items. Um, should we yeah. go on with the list? Yeah. So sure. there is um, what is still needed is a full integration test between Tendem and Dente KMS. So as I said, the integration test that is currently there or currently work in progress that needs updating um, is only the KMS talks to itself because it implements this interface and it should, um, yeah, it should also work. And but we also need something that uh, tests automatically, um, ideally automatically, um, that Tendermint and the KMS properly talk to each other, and that they stay compatible using like some form of continuous integration. Probably spin up to like Docker containers um, using Docker Compose or something like that. And there's an open issue in the KMS side, but probably this should live in tandem, and uh, we need to make sure that um, yeah, that those things properly interact with each other. Um, another thing that is on my list is we like need to clean up and further test and improve Amino RS, like the Rust implementation of Amino. Currently, this is just. Um, mm, it uses a uh, protobuf implementation by Dan Bunkert, and this, which is pretty cool because it uses uh, um, Rust metaprogramming uh, capabilities, so that you don't need to write protofiles, but you can just like annotate a struct, and then uh, the Rust compiler will generate for you the decode and encode um, method on that struct, so you can very easily. Um, um, encode and decode them, um, but currently, so so the proto um, the proto buff compatibility is given, but uh, currently um, it's very like, rudimentary in the sense that it 
just we we changed a few lines that it's able to cope with the additional prefix bytes that are introduced through amino and it probably um, to be fully amino um, it needs further attention that's uh yeah it's like these are the things that are on my list at least um, yeah that's from my side i guess Yes, I can do that. I mean, it's, it's only a couple of slides just to add a bit more information and to provide people with the links in case they, they need to do something related to that. So, you should be able to see my slides now. Okay, so basically, as uh, Ismail was, was describing, there are like two applications. Uh, this is not related to the KMS, but still it might be confusing, so it's better to kind of explain that again. There are two applications. One is for signing uh, transactions, and the other one is for signing uh, votes. So the application that was uh, um, developed for signing transactions has been released already to the um, Ledger App Store. Uh, it's in. It's only available when you are in developer mode. So you need to kind of uh, set that setting there at the at the right, uh, and then you can install that. That's allowing people to do sec p two five six k one um, signatures, and it's working with JSON uh, messages. So something something that. Um, I think it's, it's important to, to clarify and, and to put some stress is that one of the reasons that it was necessary to use JSON is because for Cosmos, we wanted to support generic messages where the schema was unknown in advance. So Protobuf and Amino require you to know the schema to recompile. Um, and in this case, it was not possible. So we have to use something that was like kind of real and in addition, the app needs to show the field names. And those field names were not going to be in amino messages. So we opted for something that was like kind of simple for developers that are going to be integrating into Cosmos. Uh, we went with JSON. Um, in the case of the validator app, we're using ED25519. Uh, it allows for double sign-in protection. And we initially moved um to json but now there the have been a as it was described some discussion around amino um now that amino is ready we can do the transition and move everything to, to amino that that should be like fairly easy now um the, the validator app in general it's working so we need to do this transition now with respect to the libraries as described too these are the links to each of the repos basically uh, there are two layers because one is how to connect via USB to the device and the other one implements the APDU protocol, which is the, the protocol that is used between the signatory or any application and the specific app that runs in the ledger. So each app that runs in the ledger has a distinct protocol and you need a library to, to do that. So it's one on top of the other. Uh, there are libraries for Rust. I mean, we, we implemented libraries for Rust, Go, uh, JavaScript, and the signatory provider. And for communication, we have libraries for Rust and Go. Um, Go is being used in Cosmos. Rust is being used in signatory. The JavaScript library is still not used as far as I know, but we had discussions like lately um, about integrating that into, the, into Cosmos and some applications. Uh, the JavaScript um, library supports both um, back end and front end. So um, it's also possible to run um, an application that connects from the browser front end or client side to the ledger and connect to the Cosmos application. Um, so what's next in this sense? The user app, we need to kind of finalize testing and, and some small details. Uh, and then we can release the final application for the validation app. We need to move to Amino. 
um, and follow up with Ledger for the final release to the App Store. And then we need the small details on the documentation and release process. For example, what Ismail was describing about like integration testing. And then some other future ideas that there have been discussions uh, on and off is all like running some kind of reliability testing on signatory to be sure that uh, signatory KMS and, and the whole end-to-end -end, uh, connection is stable and we have some kind of reliability measurements for that. And maybe at some point like evaluate high, uh, high availability or failover and uh, maybe run like kind of uh, different signatories and have raft uh, selecting which one should talk or things like that. Um, but that, that's kind of the high level idea of uh, where things are uh, with respect to Ledger and HSM. Later, there are, there are some more uh, HSMs that are being supported, like UI. Uh, I don't know if Tony was going to say something about that, but that's, that's another alternative that is also very interesting. So that's kind of from my side. Uh, of course, if, if there are questions, I mean, we can do it now or you can contact me later for any details. Um, so I can give a quick status on the KMS and where UBHSM signing is at. Yep. Uh, so I don't have any slides, but I can probably do a quick show and tell. Uh, let me see if this will work. There we go. All right. Let's see. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. Cool. Yep. All right. Um, so this is the KMS compiled, uh, kind of starting from scratch with a fresh relay reset, EVHSM. Um, so TM KMS is the new name. Uh, so there are some of the commands. Um, as a slight default config file, like this example config, it comes with, so I'm just going to copy that here. And this doesn't have uh, too much crazy in it. Um, so it's using the default uh, credentials for the UVHSM. People should definitely change those. Uh, it's going to try to auto detect the HSM, although you can pin the serial number there. Um, they do TMKMS UVHSM help. Um, it has a bunch of UVHSM subcommands here. Uh, so I can do detect. Uh, so there it shows that's the serial number of the UVHSM I plugged in. Um, and it has keys. So this is kind of like Gaia Cly. I've tried to make it pretty similar. Um, so it's generate and list are the two main commands right now. I'm going to add import and export. Uh, so if people want to take their old testnet key and put it in an HSM, that should work. Uh, so I'm going to do generate. Uh, one is just the key ID. So it has key IDs that I believe go up to 65,000, right? Um, so I'll generate. So I generated it in a 255.19 key. Uh, I can list them. Uh, right now, there's only that key. Lots of debugging. <laughs> but, so there's that. Um, and then let's see. Should hopefully work. Um, and so there's like a little load simulator in here. Uh, so this is just having it sign as fast as possible. Uh, so it's doing 128 byte messages now. I'm not sure what the size of the final messages will look like, but the amount of time the UVHSM takes varies depending on the size of the message by quite a bit. Um, but so yeah, this is a little simulator. In theory, it shouldn't crash. So I have a little switchable USB here. I'm going to switch it off. And now I can't see it. Uh, if I switch it back on, then it picks right back up. Um, I can even move the VHSM to like, different USB ports and stuff. And it should be OK. Um, 
So my next stops are kind of like document this and do like a 0.0.1 .0 release of the KMS so people can play around with this and just make sure their UBHSMs are set up right. And in theory, uh, it's all wired up in the KMS's key ring. So if people tell the key ring to sign with the UBHSM, it should work. That's basically all I've got, aside from maybe discussing a few of these items we had on the agenda there. Cool. Um, so the main big one I think needs to be addressed before a launch is double signing. Uh, yeah. So I had uh, I had proposed like a keep it simple, stupid uh, double signing defense, which was uh, like let people shell out to an arbitrary command that spits out like what it thinks the current block height is, and then provide like a few example scripts of like. This will curl all your sun trees, it'll curl like RPC and grab the block height with like JQ or something like that, right? Um, and then use that kind of just to, you know, right with the, what the current block height is, it can use that to kind of seed the current block height or something. Um, and then I, I can link the issue. I think the longer term defense is going to be having an audit log uh, outside of the KMS, uh, and possibly one that like also tracks the current state of the blockchain. Um, but yeah, to me, like I think it would be best instead of like doing raft or something inside the KMS to just have the KMS be completely stateless and have some other service kind of keep track of what the current block height is. So why why not have the KMS track the heights and rounds it's already signed for? Uh, so it could definitely do that much. Yeah. Um, so there's kind of so it can do that. There's this problem of uh, when you're doing failover, right? Yeah. Um, so really, it doesn't. It, it, it's trying to solve this kind of monotonic problem, right? Like yeah. it doesn't care. If, if you could prove there's a higher block height, it really doesn't care where it was at, right? It just wants right. the latest block height, whatever it is. Um, so it can kind of keep track of what it signed, but then maybe a failover event occurred and it can't see where else it was signed and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so also for auditing, I think it can just also shell out to like some sub optional subcommand. Uh, and people can implement whatever auditing. And what, what is the capacity for the devices themselves to, to help with this? So the ledger, um, you know, the ledger can already remember a little bit and prevent signing the uh, repeat, repeat height and round. Is that uh, possible at all on the UB? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the UBHSM has this like opaque data thing. So you can load, I think, up to like about 2K of data in any of its key slots. Mm -hmm. So we can definitely uh, track the last time block height on individual HSMs. Hmm. It just seems like something that goes stale really quickly <laughs> to me. So, uh, you know, if there's any kind of failover or what yeah. have you, right? Like, um, yeah. But. Yeah, the failover situation is tricky. I'm not sure I've seen a, a, a solution um, outside of uh, using cryptography for like having a threshold for the signing itself, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That seems to be our best bet. So I think for now, it's just going to kind of be a little bit of a fragile failover situation where you kind of have to, um, you know, use, like you were saying, like a third party process or something to, to check the latest height and prevent it there. And then hopefully, sometime in 2019, we'll be able to roll out uh, like threshold signing for validators so that they can do like a two or three across their HSMs. Yeah, and, yeah, that would be great. And then that way, prevent it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I guess the funny thing with that, we could probably do that with the UBHSMs with SACP. Yeah. Because um, it does have a hardware scalar mult operation that will work with any of the NSP curves or uh, with SACP. 
Yeah, when I say site P, I mean K1. Um. <laughs> sure. I mean, we can do it. We can even do it without with uh, just like a standard kind of multi-sig, right? Like define a pub key as being three pub keys and a signature is requiring two normal signatures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can do that. Uh, so yeah, that's definitely one option. That's kind of the keep it simple, stupid option. Um, right. Otherwise, I think you could potentially implement like block streams, uh, sec P, schnorr. Yep. Do you do like threshold schnorr, like schnorr multi-signatures with that backed in the right. Yeah, that'd be cool. Um, so we're, we're, we're trying to, we're, we're going to avoid, I think, SecP for validators in the okay. short term. Maybe yeah. we'll open that up next year. Um, so I guess in, you know, next year we're, we're, we're looking at uh, both uh, a multi-sig using the Ed25519 curve and then potentially the SecP and like a, a Schnorr type SecP combination. Um, I guess we can't really do that with the Ed curves until we get something like uh, Ristretto. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, uh, awesome work. Thanks a lot, Tony and Juan, for all your help and, and patience on this uh, on this journey. Yeah, cool. Any any other points to discuss from anyone? So, is those numbers we're getting uh, in demo like uh, it seems like it's one hundred fifty milliseconds to sign a message? Is this something which is kind of realistic, or it's uh, and also, does it depends on the what is the hardware we're using behind, or whether what is the the crypto schema which is used, like what we can expect, like what is the range of this signing uh, latency? Yeah, so the latency varies considerably depending on the size of the message. So that's using a 128 byte message. Um, so I don't know if anybody knows like ballpark what the actual size is, but I picked one I figured would be probably bigger than whatever it is. I think it's around that size, right? Let's see. Yeah. So if it's smaller, it's slightly, and slightly faster. It can be as fast as like 100 milliseconds for short messages. Um, otherwise, yeah, that's that's the end of, or that's the end of latency going from over USB to VHSM. Yeah, I think it'll be, I think it's around that size. It's, uh, it's variable because the chain ID. Yeah. 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 Cool. So, some time ago, we had this discussion with Chris about like uh, what was the upper bound uh, for the latency that we could actually handle. I don't know if there was something about that. Um, if we have some information of really what is the threshold where, um, then we will have like issues. Yeah, because like uh, 150 millisecond is is not negligible, so even for wide area setup, uh, it will it will significantly uh, it will be a significant part of the overall consensus latency. So uh, yeah, it's just uh, let's say this is the I, I actually I, I don't know why I assume that it's it takes less time, but the, I was a bit surprised to see this number, but. Uh, yeah, I think for hardware back to two fifty five nineteen, it's pretty much always going to be around that, um, or at least like a hundred milliseconds. Yeah, I guess we'll we'll have to benchmark it. I mean, all of our our timeouts are on the order of seconds, and they grow with each round. Um, so within a couple rounds, it, sh it shouldn't be a problem if we're having you know if we're having network issues or whatever, but. Um, we should we should definitely start uh, once once it's all hooked up. We can start running some tests and make sure that uh, it doesn't delay things too much. Yeah, I'm not aware of the times now that we move from JSON to Amino. Maybe it's going to get better, but yeah. I'm sure that in the ledger we won't be better than 150. It will definitely be worse. Yeah. Um, so. At some point, we were discussing on like 250. Um, so that, that, that's something to take into account when we start like playing with this because it could result in issues later. Yeah. Yeah, my, my impression or my uh, standard was thinking we should be able to hit at least a few, you know, two to three, ideally around three signatures per second, um, which sounds like in both cases we, we can. We can definitely do, and our latency over the network is likely likely to be longer than that. 
and you only need each validator is expected to produce um, at most three signatures per round. And I think we can expect the rounds to be taking at least a second or a few seconds with so many validators and so many nodes. So um, hopefully this shouldn't shouldn't prove to be much of a bottleneck, but it will it will create small delays for sure. We'll have to test it to really see. Cool guys. Um, any other thoughts, comments, objections, suggestions? Cool. Maybe maybe uh, I should point out that we have a, a couple other new folks joining today. Um, so obviously Tony and Juan, who've been working with us uh, for some time now on these projects. Also uh, Sam Alba and Andrea Luzardi, um, who are uh, ex uh, Docker employees that were with the company for a long time and are recently getting into the blockchain space. Um, we've been talking to them for a couple weeks about how they can get involved in Cosmos and Tendermint development and help out a bit. So uh, we invited them to this dev session. And, uh, so. Hopefully they've, they've been listening in here, and I thought I would just uh, introduce them uh, and give them a chance to introduce themselves if they'd like, or you know, I'm happy to let them stay silent if they'd like as well. <laughs> hey, hey, I'm, I'm Sam. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, th thanks for the intro. Uh, so, so yeah, you said it all. Basically, we, we left two months ago, and happy to join this, this community. And uh, this talk was, uh, well, I understood some of it. Uh, <laughs> basically, the code base is really new to us, uh, even though we, we have some strong, strong experience with Go, but we are we're just started to learn recently the, the specifics of uh, Tender Mint, like internals. And um, yeah, it's great to, to see how we can help. Cool. Thanks. Hey, uh, same as Sam, just catching up here. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else to say. Cool. Three presenters, and thanks for everyone attending. Um, and we're going to be back next week. And we're going to find on YouTube if anyone is watching. And yeah, have a great day, evening, wherever you are. Good morning. Cool. And see you all next week. Thank you. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Cool. We'll see Bye you later. later. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.